Chances are you've heard this sound before. This phenomenon is called acoustic beats, and it occurs when we play two tones that are very close in frequency, and those sound waves interfere with each other. Now the animation we're looking at is actually the graph of the composite wave formed from those two tones interfering, and we'll get into the details about the geometry in just a minute, but for now I just want to point out that the result is a wave whose amplitude periodically grows to a maximum and then shrinks again. So when that wave arrives at the eardrum, in other words the white line on the right hand side, we perceive a tone that's increasing and decreasing in loudness. Now to investigate the geometry behind acoustic beats, we look at our two tones separately. At the top we have a 300 Hz sound wave moving to the right and arriving at the ear, and at the bottom we have a 302 Hz sound wave. And we're using these white markers at the eardrum to show what pressure is arriving at the eardrum at any instant in time. So there's the marker on the 300 Hz wave, and there's the marker on the 302 Hz wave at this particular moment in time. So remember, sound is actually a longitudinal wave, in other words, a compression wave, so the representation we're looking at here is a little abstract. Instead of showing a compression wave, we show the pressure as a function of position and time using a transverse wave because it's just better for visualization. So keep in mind the interpretation here is that the top of a peak on one of these waves is a pressure maximum, and the bottom of a trough is a pressure minimum. And the actual sound wave is longitudinal, but our picture of a transverse wave is mathematically equivalent. The last thing I want to point out before we animate these guys is that the animations are going to be way slowed down compared to the audible frequencies. And that's just because a 300 Hz oscillation on your screen would just be an incomprehensible blur. So here's what the 300 Hz tone sounds like as the pressure wave arrives at the ear. Okay, now at the bottom we have our 302 Hz sound wave moving to the right, and here's what that sounds like. So those frequencies are so close that I can't even hear the difference. But what happens when these two tones head toward your ear simultaneously? When we superimpose these two waves, we start to see a pattern in how they overlap. In some of the regions, the wave peaks coincide almost perfectly with each other, and we get constructive interference between the waves. In other words, the amplitudes add. And then we have other regions where the wave crests from one wave overlap the troughs from the other wave, and we get destructive interference at those locations. So when we add the two waves together, in other words, simply adding the pressure values at each x coordinate, here's what we get. And that combined wave is going to move along to the right, and when it arrives at the ear, we're going to hear the loudness of our tone fading in and out. So let's put it all together in an animation and take a look at the overlapping waves moving on the left side of the screen, along with the combined total wave moving on the right. Note that the combined wave has a maximum amplitude twice as big as the component waves because amplitudes add at those points of constructive interference. So if we watch the markers for the individual waves as they arrive at the eardrum, we see that they're out of phase with each other at first, one reaching a maximum as the other reaches a minimum. So then they gradually start to catch up and they get closer and closer to being in phase with each other. Okay, now they're just about perfectly in phase, which means we would be hearing just about the loudest tone. And again, they start to drift out of phase, and we eventually get to a dead spot where the tone is suppressed by destructive interference again. Now we can get into the math, and our goal here is to derive a wave function for that composite wave, and then find an expression for the beat frequency, in other words, the frequency of the fadeouts in the tone. So we start by writing down a description of the pressure as a function of time arriving at the eardrum. Note that we don't have to use the full description of a moving wave here because we're just concerned with the pressure arriving at the eardrum and those are purely sinusoidal functions of time at a single fixed value of x. I prefer to use cosines for this, so I've called the pressure function for the 300 Hz wave a cosine omega 1t and for the 302 Hz wave a cosine omega 2t. And I want to point out that we have the same amplitude on both these waves and that's critical for getting periodic, complete destructive interference. And just a quick reminder, 
These omegas relate to ordinary frequencies in hertz through the usual relation omega equals 2 pi f. And that means we could work with these waves in terms of f1 and f2 directly. And it would look like that. So a cosine 2 pi f1t plus a cosine 2 pi f2t. But I'm going to stick with the omega representation in the main derivation here because it just makes all the math look simpler. And then we'll convert our final wave function back in terms of ordinary frequency. So let's put our math hats on and apply some trig identities. And what we're about to do is actually a super valuable trick to know for several applications in physics. What we're looking at here is a sum of two different cosines. And we can derive an identity for that if we go back to the basic formula for the cosine of a sum or a difference. And that's a formula I highly encourage my students to have memorized because it's so frequently useful. So there it is, the cosine of theta plus or minus phi is equal to the cosine of theta cosine phi minus plus sine theta sine phi. And what we mean by the minus plus there is that the plus on the left side of the equation goes with the minus on the right and vice versa. So now we can split this up into two equations. First, we're going to look at the plus case, so the theta plus phi case. And again, that goes with the minus sign on the right-hand side. And then we look at the minus case, theta minus phi. So cosine of theta minus phi is cosine theta cosine phi plus sine theta sine phi. And what we notice in this system of equations is that it has a beautiful symmetry to it. And I realize if I just add these two equations, all the sine terms are going to cancel out because I have a negative version of that in the first equation and positive in the second. So let's go ahead and add the equations. And this is almost what we're looking for. On the left-hand side there, we have a sum of two cosines, cosine theta plus phi and cosine theta minus phi. And on the right-hand side, it's been reworked into a product of two cosines with a factor of two out in front. All we have to do now is a couple substitutions just a reminder here, we're looking for an identity for a cosine omega 1t plus a cosine omega 2t. So we let theta plus phi be omega 1t and theta minus phi be omega 2t. So to express our sum of cosines as a product of two cosines, we still have to solve for theta and phi individually. And what we're looking at here is actually another system of equations that has the exact same symmetry as the first system. So we used this trick once before, and we're just going to use the same trick again. When I see a system of equations with this kind of symmetry, I just go ahead and add them, and the phi's are going to eliminate here. So those are gone. And on the left-hand side of the equation, I'll get a 2 theta. And on the right-hand side, I get an omega 1t plus omega 2t. So we're going to factor the t out of the right-hand side and divide the whole thing by 2. And there's our value of theta. It's just omega 1 plus omega 2 divided by 2 times t. In other words, what we have in here is the arithmetic mean of the two original angular frequencies. Now there's a slightly different trick that we have to use to isolate phi. Instead of adding the two equations, we simply subtract them. So I'm going to subtract the bottom equation from the first. Now the thetas are going to cancel and I end up with a phi minus negative phi, in other words, two phi on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, omega 1t minus omega 2t. Again, we're gonna factor the t out and divide by two and we have an expression for phi. So remembering that we still have to multiply an A into this trig identity, we can sub everything in, and we end up with this final result where we've taken the sum of our original cosines. In other words, we're adding points on two sinusoidal functions, and we re-express that as a product. And it turns out to be two times A, two times the original amplitude of one of the waves, times a cosine that has the average of the two original angular velocities, times another cosine that has the difference of those two angular velocities over two. And now that we've expressed that sum as a product of two cosines, we can get some deeper insight into the shape of the resulting function. So notice that I just took the liberty of moving the difference cosine to the front and collecting it with the two a. And then we have our cosine with the average angular frequency at the end of the expression. Now let's go ahead and re-express all this stuff back in terms of ordinary frequency. Remember that omega is 2 pi times frequency, so every one of those omegas can be replaced with a 2 pi times frequency, omega 1 with a 2 pi f1, and omega 2 with a 2 pi f2. Of course, we could then factor the 2 pi's out, and now our function looks like this. Now the reason I didn't just cancel the 2's in here is because I know that when I have a cosine of 2 pi times something times t, that something is the frequency of that cosine. So written this way, I can tell the frequency of the first cosine is f1 minus f2 divided by 2, and the frequency of the second cosine is the arithmetic mean of the two participant frequencies, so f1 plus f2 divided by 2. 
And to get insight into the graph of this function, we notice that that entire part out in front is a very slowly oscillating function. And then the part tacked on at the end is a fast oscillating function. And that's just because we're dealing with typical audible sound waves here. So we know our frequencies are in the hundreds or thousands of Hertz. And this whole thing is predicated on the two frequencies being pretty close together. So the difference between them is small. So the way we're going to view this entire function is to say that that slow part out in front is actually a changing amplitude of the fast part that's at the end of the expression. So our slow changing amplitude part, that has a maximum value of 2a, where a is the original amplitude of one of the participant functions, but it's oscillating. And in particular, I want to point out that that oscillating amplitude out in front of our fast cosine is periodically going all the way to zero. In fact, it does that twice for every period of the cosine function. And that means this fast cosine is pinched all the way to zero periodically. So here's what the resulting function looks like. So that yellow curve is the composite wave. But the way you want to look at that is that you start with a fast cosine function where the frequency is equal to the average of the original two waves. And then that's being pinched to zero periodically by this oscillating amplitude that's out in front. Now the white curves that I've also shown in this picture have a special name. That's called the modulating envelope for the function. So we can say what we're looking at here is a fast cosine modulated by a slow cosine. And actually those two white curves are just a plot of only that slow part that's out in front of this function and it's negative giving us an upper and a lower bound for the function so what should we hear when this wave arrives at our eardrum first we're not going to perceive the beat frequency as a tone it's way too slow to be perceived as a tone by the human ear what we hear is that fast part the fast wiggles in this graph and that has a frequency equal to the average of the two original waves that were interfering with each other. Second, we're going to perceive beats. We have this modulating envelope with a frequency equal to the difference of the original two frequencies divided by two. Now here's a tricky point. When people say beat frequency, they mean how often do the beats actually happen? How many fade outs are there per second? And there are two of those for every oscillation of that slow cosine. So while F1 minus F2 over two is the frequency of the modulating envelope, the frequency that the beats occur at is twice as much as that. So we're going to say the beat frequency is actually equal to the absolute value of the difference in our two frequencies. Now, if you're concerned about the absolute value, the whole point of that is that we want to state a beat frequency as a positive number of beats per second. So we need to guarantee that it's positive and we throw some absolute value bars on there. And maybe it's reassuring to point out here that the cosine function is even. So if we reverse the difference in there and say F2 minus F1 instead of F1 minus F2, that produces a minus sign. But being an even function, the cosine of the negative of an angle is equal to the cosine of the original angle. So it doesn't make a difference anyway. So we'll wrap things up with a quick example. And we've kind of already been working on this example. We're told we have two sound waves arriving at our ear with frequencies of 300 hertz and 302 hertz. And we want to find the frequency of the perceived tone and the beat frequency. So the tone that you're going to hear, remember, has a frequency equal to the arithmetic mean, or just the simple average, of the frequencies of the two participant waves. So the average of 300 and 302, that's 301 hertz. And of course, that's practically indistinguishable from 300 hertz or 302 hertz. They all sound the same to me, but maybe there's some musical savant out there that can tell the difference. And second, the beat frequency, as it turns out, the number of fade outs per second is simply equal to the difference between these frequencies where we don't worry about plus and minus signs. So we should hear two fade outs per second. So let's take one more listen to those original beats between a 300 hertz and 302 hertz wave and see if it sounds like two fade outs per second. 